No, I'm from a company called In Any Real Time, a local company started about four years ago in Sydney. So still fairly small, but uh, growing fairly rapidly. Um, what I'm going to present on, to you on today is basically interfacing smart cities. So not necessarily the um, systems which run smart cities in the background, but how end users actually interface with all of the data that we have to deal with on a daily basis. So, uh, and that's will give some context. So what we do is we create 3D interfaces and this is all about intuitive controls and user experience. So this is aimed at uh, the entire swath of users of any system from someone on the ground, say a cleaner that has a job to do, all the way up to an executive or a minister which has to make large decisions quickly on very little information. So what that comes down to is something like this, information overload. This is what we're currently dealing with in our smart cities. Um, we have a massive amount of information. As an example, this is a uh, dashboard for a wind farm, and it gives you a sense of all of the controls needed just to operate at a single facility. Uh, when you start taking more facilities, such as transport, power, energy, waste management, and add that into the system, you end up with a massive amount of data which can become quite difficult to engage with. So it's about reducing that complexity to something very intuitive for us to interface with and control, something more like this. Um, through our mobile devices, because that's where we actually spend a lot of our time these days. Um, of course, this is also about future technologies. So part of what we do is we think about the future of the environments we create. So virtual reality is a, a new fad which is out, but it's actually all heading towards this augmented reality, this idea that there's this pervasive virtual world existing in tandem with the real world. And this allows us to interact with data in a fluid way. For instance, in this image, this is the uh, Microsoft HoloLens. Um, you can see that he has his recipes up on the, uh, up on the wall, his TV on, that he's placed on the wall, and which will actually follow him around as he moves. So it's about access to information. Um, how we do this is actually through game technology. Uh, game technology um, can seem like it might be for kids, but realistically, it's a very powerful platform which allows us to achieve a lot of information. So uh, I always relate this back to two, uh, two kids, two 12-year-olds, one in Australia and one in Sweden playing a video game. They have to interact instantly. And if we replace those kids with professionals, we actually have the same uh, technology model. So that's the concept behind it. Um, there's a, lots of reasons we use game technology, but two very specific ones are cross-platform capability. So this is about getting it out to everyone's devices, their PC, their Mac, their iPhone, their Android, any device uh, the gaming industry by default has to engage with. So this means that before anyone else, games actually engage with new technology first, and that leads on to future hardware. So future hardware comes out and sometimes it's disruptive. Sometimes it actually changes the systems that we already use, are using very significantly and it makes technology redundant. So by engaging with the, a gaming platform, we can actually keep ourselves relevant. And as the new technology comes out, we can interrelate it back to existing and past <laughs> environments. Um, a good example of this is uh, one project we did a few years ago. Um, a 14-year-old boy in Sweden actually solved how to get virtual reality working um, before anyone else. So when the Oculus Rift came out, he had it working within about 24 hours, shared it with a broader open data community, and within about 48 hours, we'd actually backlogged all of our um, existing content with this new hardware. So it's a very uh, agile approach to both technology and systems. Um, a lot of this will make a lot more sense when I actually show the demonstrations. And this is a good example, I guess, of heritage in, in cases of this. When we think about smart cities, we're not only talking about new developments, we're talking about existing developments. And this is actually a very old church in Sydney at a prominent ladies' college. Um, we created this environment, which is a, almost a realistic representation of the real space, and overlaid all of the existing uh, electrical diagrams so maintenance could better operate this um, quite old but very historically significant uh, facility. <coughs> um, in we can take that in terms to new developments such as the high-speed rail. So uh, visual content is a must in terms of getting these projects across the line. We have to understand how they work and we have to see it before we actually commit to them. Otherwise, we get many problems, not only through the design pr processes, but into construction and into maintenance as well. So this was an image of uh, the proposed high-speed rail. Um, and this is a cross-section of that same uh, tunnel. 
what we would do is we would create this into a virtual environment which allows us to get uh, value across every stage of its development, the design stage, the construction for the stage, and the maintenance stage. So how we do this is this concept of the duality of real time. So real time data is all around us. It's something we deal with on a daily basis. Um, when we're making a bank transfer, our banks need to know instantly that we've made that transfer so we can't make the same transfer twice. So data side we're actually really good at. It's the experience side that we're not so good at. So how do we actually convey this to say a million users or five million users or even one very specific important user? And that's where this um, visual approach comes in and starts making a lot of sense. Uh, a part of this is also this idea of BIM. So building information modeling is a new concept, or it's actually about a 30-year-old concept, but it's getting a lot of traction in recent years because it's a more efficient and better way to build and construct buildings. Uh, what we're doing is we're integrating that BIM data to make it relevant to maintenance. So how can we pass the design and construct information down through the line and make it a valuable asset for the entire life? And this is all about getting efficiencies and business processes which allow us to make better decisions um, at every stage of, a de of design development. Um, part of this is this concept of metadata. With everything we do, there's a single piece of data associated to or multiple pieces of data. Um, BIM is a classic example. And what we need to do is we need to tie that together into a single metadata model which allows us to utilize it across, um, across different systems, pr both proprietary and open. So, um, and this will make a lot of sense when you see the concepts. What this is about is linking this value chain. So traditionally, if you look at the construction and development industry and infrastructure, uh, all of these different departments exist kind of in silos, that the bid team don't really talk to the design team, the design team don't talk to the marketers, and the marketers don't even know who the operations people are. So it's really about pulling these all into one common environment which allows everyone to get benefits from everyone else's previous work. Um, specifically at the moment, we're concentrating on both the marketing phase and the operational phase. So marketing is a vital tool to convey this information to the population and to key stakeholders. Uh, they have massive budgets, but it's used very once or twice only for very specific purposes. By utilizing that budget and creating a virtual asset, we can pass it off to the operational team so they can gain value from that same information. So, um, and this is all about a visual approach to spatial interaction and it's about getting better project outcomes by the end. I'm just going to show you a quick case study now so it makes a lot more sense. <coughs> so about three years ago when we were a very young company, uh, we got engaged in Barangaroo. So Len Lease has engaged us for their, um, what they call their open building systems integration. Their open building systems integration is an approach where they take all of the pieces of software used to um, run, a, run a development. So in these international towers that you see here, there's going to be about 30 pieces of software to run the building. So that's anything from the lighting systems, the air conditioning systems, security management, um, CCTV, parking, almost anything you can imagine. They all have their own pieces of software and needs to actually operate them. So by combining them into a single platform, we can actually start getting better business efficiencies. We can know that that air conditioner is broken because of a power surge in the power system which we're monitoring at a different time. So what this leads to is predictive maintenance. And predictive maintenance means that we can um, create better outcomes from our buildings, not only for the building owners, but also for the tenants. So everyone gets benefit from the efficiencies created. Um, as part of that, we came in as the visual front end. So when you're dealing with that much information, you're back to that first comment I made about information overload. The dashboard for these buildings is a very powerful dashboard, but it takes about two to three months to learn. And to actually get real efficiencies out of the buildings, it's probably six months to a year of really understanding how things are operating and pulling those efficiencies together. So, what we do is we take all of the design documentation and engineering drawings and pull them together into a common environment. And this allows us to not only represent the buildings for design and construction, but hand it off to the operations people so they can better operate their facilities. And you'll see the level of detail this model goes down to when I zoom in here. So it's pretty much from bolt level out to city level. So in creating this environment, 
We took LiDAR scan data of the city, which is accurate to about 12 and a half centimetres. So we can do things like um, sun shadowing and see how the effect of um, a new development will affect the overall city at a given time of day or year. Um, we took the engineering drawings from multiple contractors, architects, engineers, electrical engineers, plumbers and so forth and combined it all into a single environment. Um, for the techie people out there or the people who understand technology, the amount of information in this environment is equivalent to about 600 million polygons. On average um, in uh, say the uh, construction software they use to design these buildings, they can get to about a million polygons. So this is 600 fold times more powerful. And this is largely because of this gaming technology I was talking about before. So if we fly into one of the levels, you'll see that it goes all the way down to um, essentially office detail. So we can start getting efficiencies at multiple levels of environment um, to the point where these, the imagery you're seeing outside of the window in this <coughs> environment is the actual imagery taken from a drone at the height of these buildings about seven years before these um, developments were com completed. So this allows us to understand things and you can start seeing how this links to both marketing and operations. So the marketing people have used this to help lease the development, um, giving lend lease efficiencies and, uh, and basically a quick approach to delivering these buildings. Um, but not only that, it's allowed uh, the builders and then the facilities managers to understand their facility long before it was um, finished so they could plan for how they're actually going to operate this environment. So I'll just fly out of here. So these are similar to a fly-through. So we get fly-throughs done all the time for new developments. But fly-throughs are an endpoint. They create a single piece of content which doesn't get reused. So our approach is to, to take that content, get the same outputs, but retain the data behind it. And so behind all of these elements you see in this environment, there's actually data and information traveling around. Um, a good example of that is the construction sequences. So one of the first things we did was link up the engineer drawings uh, with the program, uh, the program manager's drawings. So essentially how they were going to be constructing the building. And we can stop this and go to any particular point in time throughout the entire life cycle and actually see how the project is developing. So this can be used for comparisons to see how a projected timeline versus an actual timeline is proceeding and where certain issues might have arisen during the project so we can see why they happened. It's all about project communication. Um, in this particular example, it became a very useful tool for a prominent bank which was moving into the centre tower to help with their change management process. So they were moving about 19,000 staff into this building and they had a concern about this being a construction site for two years after they were moving in. So with this tool, they could understand at what point they could move certain people into certain levels of different towers, knowing that there wasn't going to be a construction site outside their window 20 metres away from them. And that was one of the small elements we uh, did for that particular organisation. Um, some of the other elements included things like induction training and safety training and evacuation planning. And this all related to risk reduction and risk management for them. So their big concern was, is their staff, obviously, being a banking corporation. And they wanted to know how Lendlease were going to be keeping their, their staff safe. So we put in the Lendlease as hoarding diagrams. Um, additionally, just as an extra, we also put in the marketing material so the marketers could turn this into a signage testing exercise to understand how their signage would be displayed to visitors to the site, um, increasing the value of the overall development. Um, once the banking corporation saw this, they understood the value of visual content for their staffs. And then we've done a, a series of induction videos and evacuation plans, which would have been cost prohibitive to make to this level of detail without having this virtual asset to begin with. So, uh, and I'll show you one of those videos in a moment. And so the level of detail here, we've used this for the design development this stage, um, largely for design collaboration, uh, coordinating all of the various contractors and partners onto a single project, uh, which formed the basis of this environment, which then got handed off to the project managers and builders who could actually see how this thing was um, going to be built. And then this has formed the basis for the OBSI, which is actually operating the building in the long term. So, 
to give you a, ver a very small sense of that. I won't show you the live application because it's actually linked into the buildings as we speak. But for instance, we can open and control building elements such as turning on lights, opening shutters, unlocking doors and so forth, all through sensor technology or as they better call it, uh, better known these days, Internet of Things, so IoT technologies. Um, for instance, and I'm not doing it right now, when I open and close one of these things, this will open and close a real one in life on that same building and vice versa, if it's open and closed on the, in real life, it's open or closed here. So it becomes a virtual representation of the real world. And this allows us to do testing, simulation, evacuations. We can plan for how we actually are going to operate our facility before we get there. In terms of the high-speed rail, there's going to be a lot of challenges. And those challenges come down to data, infrastructure, geography, business processes, um, business needs, community engagement. And you need a visual tool which gets everyone on the same page. Pulling yeah, within the stations and the track. So we can actually represent these simulation ideas before they happen. So if there's a particular um, work type statement which needs to be achieved, which is complex in nature, we can model it, model it up, simulate it, and actually make sure that it's going to work before we achieve it. Um, we've saved uh, Brangaroo, well, I'm not going to say any figures, but we've saved them a large amount of uh, um, investment in mistakes not made. So being able to test it first, making the mistake first in a virtual environment, and then being sure that the solution that they've suggested will work at a later stage um, is vital to how this all kind of comes together. So I'll show you one last environment, and then I'll uh, finish up. So this not only is about smart buildings um, and smart cities. So smart buildings for us are the basis of this. If we don't capture the information inside a building, our cities will never be smart because 80% of activity actually happens inside buildings, not out in the streets. Um, some of the vital uh, activities happen out in the streets, but we have to get all of the information for, at multiple levels from kind of macro to, to micro. Um, and in terms of that, this is a proof of concept we've done with Transport for New South Wales, which was about uh, si simulation planning and scenario planning. So uh, how is the, the network, New South Wales Transit Network, going to work in relation to um, people movement and scheduling? So the way that we currently schedule allows for, at most, two schedules or three schedules to be created a year, which means that we are fairly slow in responding to um, quick changes. Um, we took all of their data, um, incorporated and digitized it essentially, put it into a system which allows us to see um, incoming, outgoing passengers, station capacity, how many passengers are, are on platform, and a range of other factors linked to uh, these environments. Um, what we can then do is we can set all of our, uh, our requirements. We can say that maybe out at showground we have an event, so we have 20,000 people. We can put 20,000 people in there, um, run a simulation, and you'll see the little trains running around the tracks here. And you'll actually see how it's affecting our stations as we go. So once we've done this, what this lets, it lets us see to a greater level of detail and quicker, rather than two schedules a year or six months, I can do about 20 in an afternoon, which means iteration leads to better outcomes. <coughs> What's more, this can be used for that kind of project engagement point where I can get down to street level and actually see how my system is being affected both from a macro scale and to a micro scale. Uh, there's also a range of extra things. There's analytics in here. There's a huge amount of data. There can be live data. We can link this up to the actual um, system. So we can have a, a simulated mode as well as a virtual mode where we're showing the actual state of the tracks, where our trains are, how many people have scanned in at which opal points to which stations. And we can actually respond to emergencies, for instance, much better and quicker because of tools like this. Uh, in terms of the high-speed rail and the smart cities, which we're going to be heading towards, these tools are going to be vital in the next five to 10 years in how all of our population actually interact with both our infrastructure and our smart cities. Um, so, and feel free to ask any questions, and thank you very much.